he is alive. Amen. We're celebrating that today. We're so glad you're here. I am Pastor Warren. This is my wife, Kim. Good morning. It is a great day to be here. It is a great day to be a Christian. It's a great day to be serving the Lord. So we just welcome you this morning to the River Center. We're so happy that you're here. We hope you enjoy this service this morning. You know, this morning, we're going to take you a bit on a journey. We're going to go through that weekend on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you're going to hear things about the crucifixion. You're also going to hear things about the resurrection. And then you're also going to hear things about the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. And so it's going to be an awesome time together here this morning, whether you're here in person or you're online with us. We're so glad you're here as we get to celebrate this wonderful, wonderful day. So um, during our service this morning, um, we're all going to hang out together. Our kids are going to hang with us. I know if you have you know, little ones, if you have tiny itty bitty ones, our nursery is open. There's a um, broadcasting going on in there as well. We also have another room that's broadcasting behind this building, I mean, building, behind this room, and you're more welcome to go in there if you'd like to. Um, but we don't mind the noise. We don't mind the kids. And so we're glad you could be here with us. Our kids are actually going to do something a little bit later on as they're going to tell us the resurrection story. And so it's just awesome just to be able to spend time here this morning. And also as we're singing and worshiping, if you need prayer this morning, we have a prayer station in the back. We love to pray for you um, as we're just allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our midst here today. So why don't you stand with Kim and I and the rest of the team here. Let's just begin with a word of prayer as we just look forward to what God wants to do here today. Lord God, we just delight in being called sons and daughters. We've been added to a heavenly family. Lord, that we're now part of the kingdom of God. And Lord, we just celebrate that this morning. And it's because of your resurrected Savior, Lord Jesus, that we now have this new life. And Lord, we celebrate it today as a church, as a people that get it, that understand it, that have been, have been awoken to the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. And, and Lord, even though we celebrate this every day, it's something special just to, just to be real intentional about what you have done for us. And God, we just worship you now. In song, we're going to praise you. We're going to hear the word. We're going to hear teaching. We're going to spend time with one another. And, and Lord, we just thank you for that time this morning. Lord, we just praise you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Till I bet. 
book I'm writing called Untold Stories. Uh, we're going to hear from a centurion, a Roman soldier. It says, I was a, a soldier. My allegiance was to my emperor Tiberius. I was stationed as a centurion in the city of Jerusalem under the authority of the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate. I'm in the line of many fine soldiers. My father served in Rome under Emperor Augustus and his father before him. It was an honor to be among the many that picked up arms in service to the empire. I've been a witness to many a crucifixion, being one of our emperor's favorite ways to end the life of those disloyal to the empire. But what I witnessed this day was like none other. The role I had to play still makes me shudder, and, and what I know now haunts me to this very day. The cry came to man our post so early that day. I was an early riser, but this was ridiculous. We hadn't heard of an uprising, and Barabbas was behind bars. So what was the urgency of the call? Gather your things and meet us at the forecourt of Pontius Pilate's residence, came the unsympathetic order. I moved with haste, but my pace quickened as I saw the crowd. It was growing by the minute, and my duty was to protect the city from such uprising. I made my way through the crowd with no apology. I was a centurion, and these Jews were beneath me. It wasn't long, and I was standing in the forecourt now facing the crowd with Governor Pilate elevated, speaking to the crowd behind me. It wasn't my duty to hear what was being said, only to protect and show authority to those that would cause civil unrest. I recall taking out my sword and with the butt of it, striking a man with such force that even I was startled by the blow. Not this day, not on my watch, I said without care, as if people were listening. Actually, there was very few concerned with what I had to say. Everyone was focused on the man standing next to Pilate, this Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, this name rings a bell to me. I remember just recently when the crowds gathered around a man named Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. You would think he was king coming to save the Jews from Roman tyranny. This, this couldn't be the same man, could it? I could hear Pilate behind me saying to this man, are you the king of the Jews? I didn't hear Jesus' response, but before you knew it, we were given orders to take Jesus before King Herod. Oh, how Pilate despised Herod. He considered him a poser. He really had no authority except that which was given him by the emperor. He must have felt that if Jesus was king of the Jews, then who better to judge this matter than the king of the Jews himself, Herod? It was a circus, and one I despised attending. Herod was asking for miracles, and none were given. Jesus had nothing to say to him. It was as if Jesus knew that neither Herod or Pilate were in control of his destiny. Between Pilate and Herod, nobody wanted to decide this poor man's fate. 
but the crowd wouldn't let up. It was at this moment that Pilate brought out Barabbas. I couldn't wrap my mind around what Pilate was thinking. The custom was for Pilate to release one prisoner during this feast. But what was he thinking bringing out Barabbas? Suddenly, a light went off in my head. I get it. Bring out the worst of the criminals, and they'll for sure let this man Jesus go. But to our surprise, the crowd called for Barabbas. As if a dark cloud fell over us all, they started chanting, Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. My part in this drama still haunts me in the shadows. I stood in the inner court with a cat of nine tails in my hand, and by order of our prefect was instructed to scourge the prisoner to an inch of his life. W was I beating an innocent man? I've never had this thought before. We've all taken turns scourging prisoners, criminals, that had deserved this just punishment, but this man did nothing. I can still hear my father's voice in my head. Son, the job of a soldier is not to question why, for our lives are forfeit. We serve at the pleasure of the emperor. He wills us to live or die. Why did this ache persist? I did my duty, and I did it well. Fellow soldiers mocked him, spat on him, pulled at his beard put a crown of thorns on his head, beat him, put a purple cloak on him only to tear it off, displaying his open wounds. I took no part in this, or, or did I? Standing off in the distance, I did nothing to stop it, and my hands still stained with Jesus' blood. What have I done? I was with the parade that marched Jesus up to Golgotha, and his language meant place of the skull. My pride was gone. My heart was heavy. I became more like a spectator than a participant in this tragic scene. Every hammer to the nail sent shivers up my spine. I'd every desire to scream, stop, what are we doing? But not the courage to utter a word. I remember this like yesterday as Jesus said from the cross, Eli, Eli, lam sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one he claimed to be his father had abandoned him here on Golgotha. My mind was spinning. I wasn't sure if what I felt was real. The torment within was as if my heart was being ran over by a horse-drawn chariot. I heard people screaming and others running around hysterically as the ground began to shake. Later I heard that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And others said they saw dead men walking around. But what was going on? Had I lost my mind or have we just witnessed the greatest atrocity known to mankind? While others ran, I stood frozen, paralyzed by the events of the day and the conclusion of it hanging on a cross before me. Before I knew it, I uttered the words, truly, this was the Son of God. I didn't care who heard, me, who heard me. I actually wanted people to hear me. Look what we've done. We just killed the Son of God. I began to weep, and, and soldiers don't weep. With my hands over my face, I turned and walked off that hill called Calvary. My heart so forlorn, I could barely utter the words, What have I done? What have we done?
We are not going to pass a offering plate today. If you want to give, there's a little black box back in the back there. I would encourage you to make that a happy place this morning. Um, you can also give online through our website or through the River Center app as well. I want to kind of keep in the flow of the service with the offering today. So I want to really quote to you words that Jesus said, since it's all about Jesus today. This is out of Matthew chapter 6. He says, and these are red words, the words that I really love in our Bible. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven for neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now yesterday, my wife went online and she was going to purchase some airline tickets. And we had some uh, airline credit that we had uh, accrued. And she went online and did everything and pressed the button that's supposed to make it work and it didn't work and instead it actually redirected her to make a phone call to a travel agency in order to confirm the transaction since it didn't work online so my wife did that and after the fact we learned that this was actually a scam that it was a phishing exercise and that they were actually trying to steal our airline credit miles not only that they tried to steal our credit card information as well too so it's interesting that God put on my heart to share this scripture and then yesterday we have this prime example of how thieves will try to break in and steal and destroy now I think in this scripture God is not trying to be just a heavy bummer oh you can't have anything you can't have any fun like if you're gonna invest in the kingdom then you're just gonna have to give up all your worldly possessions. I don't think that's what he's saying here. I think he wants to say to help us understand that the things in the natural are in a process of decay. And we don't think about that often. But even the things that we think are really resilient, the things on earth, those things wear out over time. The law, the law of second law of thermodynamics is really in play for us so what's he telling us he's saying for us to store up treasures in heaven and it's interesting that word store up it doesn't mean just once it means this constant practice of investing into the kingdom of god where good things are going to happen for the kingdom i like there's a connection to the word abiding in the book of john we see how jesus says abide in me and if my words abide in you ask whatever you will and it will be granted to you there's an aspect of abiding that's a constant ongoing relationship with christ and i think that's what god wants to do with our giving as well today so let me pray over the offering god you are so good and we're here to celebrate the resurrection today and father i just ask for your blessing upon those who realize that it's important for us to store up treasures in heaven. May you use those funds for your purposes and for your plans and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to visit the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and he was clo his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. But as Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary mother of James, and several other women arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside from the entrance. When they entered the tomb, they saw two men clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, he said. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? 
I know you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Look, this is where they laid his body. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. And now quickly go to, quickly and tell his disciples, including Peter, that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of Galilee. To You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. Rem- remember what I have told you. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot, at the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? Because they have taken my Lord, and they don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So if you have taken him, tell me where you have took him, and I will go and get him. Mary. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbi. Which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The woman fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered. And they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened, but also filled with great joy. They rushed to give the disciples the angel's message, and they found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I've seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. But Peter and the other disciple jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the leaden wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in, in his hands and in his side. Amen. They were filled with joy when they saw him. Again, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The end. Amen. Come on. Woo. Awesome. Very good. Boy, what an amazing story, huh? I mean, just realizing what Jesus Christ has done. And then he breathed on them, and they were full of the Spirit of God. And we, too, are now reflections of the Spirit of God in us and through us. Uh, we had an opportunity this morning as, we're, as we heard of the centurion witnessing the crucifixion, and then these young people out of the Gospels um, just speaking of the resurrected Savior. And then to realize that you know, as we're listening to these things, that this story continues and this journey continues with us, that we are the Acts Church. And Acts isn't the talk church, it's the Acts Church. It's not, hey, let's just talk about Jesus. Let's act out what it is to be a new life full of Jesus Christ person on this planet. And so it's the Acts of, as we read the Acts, it's amazing all the things that took place. Well, we're a continuation of that story. But to realize what the resurrection did, it changed everything. It radically changed everything that we could possibly imagine. I want to talk about that just a little bit here this morning, because there's implications to what happened at that weekend. Um, and, And hopefully you'll recognize how it's impacted you. But just as Jesus died, those that believe in Jesus died with him. It says in Romans 6, 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. We've been liberated from the bondage of sin. 
that which once enslaved us, enslaved our lives, that we found ourselves walking in bitterness, in rage, in hatred, in judgment, in condemnation, in depression, in loathing, in fighting, in lying, just keeps going on and on and on, is that we were dead in our sin, that we were not alive, that we were walking around as dead people living for ourselves. And then Jesus died and he set us free. And here's the good news in Romans 6, verse 4. It says, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. But just as he rose, so we're celebrating his resurrection, but we must remember that his resurrection was for a purpose. It wasn't just to say, look what, it wasn't him like a little kid going, hey, look what I could do. You know, I can rise from the dead. That's not what he was doing. What he was doing, he was doing something significantly that would change mankind, that would change the human race, that would be, give us an opportunity to have this new life to live back in relationship, reconciliation to the Father. And it's exciting to think about that, that now we can walk differently because of that, that Jesus has given us new walking papers we don't have to walk in the flesh anymore. We can now walk in the spirit. Amen? Amen. And I think when we think about how we used to walk, I, I would think there would be a radical difference between before we understood the resurrection and the life that we have and the good news of the gospel, that we were just living life. And it was beating the living daylights out of us. And it was like, woe is me. We're a bunch of Eeyores living life. And then all of a sudden we discover because of the illumination of the Spirit in us, and he calls us and draws us, and he awakens us to the good news, all of a sudden we're like, man, I, I think differently. I, 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 I feel differently. Something has changed in me. Now I'm alive. In verse um, 17 of chapter 5, it says, but if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, then he says, much more with those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now this morning, really quickly, I want to try to help you understand this. And, and I apologize for this because I have to use a Christmas story. Um, I, I wish I could say there's an Easter story out there, but it's not. This is a Christmas story. How many of us have ever watched the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? You know, some of us, maybe the different generation is we're like, yeah, and others like, what are you talking about? You know, um, but it's a great, it's a great movie. It's about um, George Bailey, right? And, and as, as we look at the story, just a real quick um, synopsis of the story. It's this story shows us a man that lived a life without the understanding of its beauty or its wonderment. He was dead, blind to the truth of how wonderful his life really was. And because of an unfortunate event, he actually at one point decided to say, hey, I'm going to end my life. It's not worth living. And then we have this amazing little angel guy named Clarence that shows up and rescues him. And then Clarence shows him a life, a world without George in it. And then we have George. He gets this second chance, right? Once he realizes how life is without him, he realizes and the life that he once lived isn't different. It's he's different. So it's not, it's not like all of a sudden when he has a second chance that everything's different around him is that he becomes different. And, and I remember one of the parts of the story when, when George runs in, this is towards the end, he's, he's going to see Mary and everything, and he has this banister, and on it there's this little knob, if you remember the knob, right? And, and the first time he grabbed this, and the knob comes off of the banister. And the first time in the movie when he grabs it, he looks at the knob and he wants to throw it across the house. This time he grabs the knob, and he grabs a hold of it and looks at it and then kisses it and, and, and puts it back. And, and you ask yourself, what, what changed? The, the knob is still the knob. It, it's still broken. It's still not fixed. It's still there. But, but what, what happened? I would say this way. He was given an understanding, the knowledge of what was real and what was valuable. I think church, what we have to realize when Jesus Christ gives us a new life through his resurrection, we've been given an understanding, the knowledge of what is real and what is valuable. Before, I used to mow the lawn just to get it done. 
Now, when I mow the lawn, I think, or actually my father-in-law mows the lawn more than I do, but now that I mow the lawn, I said, I understand that I'm spending time with the Lord and I'm marveling at his creation. Before, when, I, when the kids were misbehaving, I disciplined them out of my anger and frustration. Now, I realize discipline is an act of love and that I have an opportunity to show that to my kids every time we walk through correction. Before, depression sank in whenever I had to do the bills or talk to a creditor. Now it takes me to my knees, and I thank God for what I have and trust him for what I don't have. Before, I was looking for something to complain about or someone or something to blame for my life being hard. Now, I realize God is good, and he works all things together for his good pleasure. The, the resurrection gave me, gives us a second chance to live life knowing what we now know. That because of Jesus Christ, we act differently, we behave differently, we think differently about situations that I used to have a problem about. Now I realize, wait a minute, I, I see these things different because I've been awakened to the wonderful life that I have in Christ Jesus. That I am now alive in Christ as he rose, so I too have risen with him, and therefore I live life completely different. And that's an exciting place to be. The resurrection changed how we see life and how we live life. Church, that's a great place to say, I amen. Amen. This is awesome to be awakened to the gospel, to be awakened to this good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, this morning, we're going we're, we're gonna to wrap things up here in just a little bit, but, but we're going to have an awesome opportunity here now to hear from an apostolic voice in our lives in this church. Lee Yarbrough is a po an apostle to this church, and he's in Mexico serving churches in Mexico. He serves churches all around the world, um, but he's serving this church. And I thought what a blessing it would be to have Lee come on and just speak to us and spend a little bit of time with us this morning. So I'm going to move over here and hopefully this is going to work out. And hey, we're going to see Lee Yarbrough. Hey. Hey. How you doing, brother? I'm doing very well. Though. Good. Now, buenos, I, buenos dias. Oh, go ahead. Buenos dias. Uh, Lee, Lee's been part of our, actually been watching our service the whole way through, so it's great to have Lee join us, but I thought it'd be awesome to have an apostolic voice speaking to us as God's been challenging us to go to places where um, we're talking about crossing over, things God's calling us to do, um, but as we're alive in Christ, I think it's great to have Lee come and just speak to us a little bit, and then Lee, at the end, Lee, you're going to give us an awesome prayer over our house, Amen. Amen. Sure thing. Great to have you here. Well, thank you. Uh, buenos dias to all of you there at the River Center. Uh, those that are listening online as well. It's, uh, it's great to be with you today. As always, I can't see you, but uh, I trust that you uh, are having a, a, a good, happy Easter time this morning. I've enjoyed everything that I've listened to today so far. It's been great. Uh, I was thinking about this, actually, last night I was up quite late um, thinking about sharing a few things this morning, and I really did feel that the Lord wanted uh, me to remind you about the name of the church there, the River Center. And we know that whatever the river of God touches, it brings life, it brings healing. It, it's, it's, it's something that just produces uh, something really well in life in it. And I believe that's the kind of church you're supposed to be. Uh, really a church that's out, going out, like a river flowing out. And whatever it touches in the wasteland or in the, wherever it goes, it's going to be bringing life. And I really feel, you guys have probably heard that before many times about the name of your church. But just I, it just came to my mind last night late when I was just kind of up thinking about this morning, uh, that what you're called to be and called to do, you are and we are the people of God, the river of God flowing through us and in us uh, to reach people and to reach the nations of the world. I was thinking about what to share this morning and um, a little bit with you, and I was going to read, well, I'm going to read out of 1 Peter, and I was going to read out of chapter 2, but I'm actually going to start chapter 1, thinking about this this morning, uh, and it says this, this is obviously Peter writing, uh, he's not writing, he's actually, he was, it was a scribe that wrote, 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 
the book of First Peter, Silas, Silvanus, but he's the one who actually was telling him what to write down. But he says in First Peter chapter 1, and it just says this, and before I, before I continue, I just want to say something. If you're visiting today at the River Center, feel very welcome. I know that many times in Easter and around Christmas time, people come for the first time to church. Uh, so please feel welcome. Please feel comfortable if you're sitting online as well. Uh, thanks for being here, and um, hopefully you'll uh, be encouraged by what you're hearing and seeing today online. But it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, it's, it's really good. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to remember always that praise and the glory is to him. It's all because of him and through him Amen. that we have everything. He says, in his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And this is really important because I wanted to mention this in our context today. Uh, it says, in this, you greatly, or in this, you, uh, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even through refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter is writing to a group of people, they're Gentiles, that were going through a lot of hardship. They were facing hostility. They were being harassed in their context. Um, they're being persecuted by the Greek and Roman, by their Greek and Roman neighbors. And so what these people, the Gentiles, had understood was about a Jewish nation that was obviously the chosen, chosen nation of God, but actually the gospel now is breaking out of Jerusalem. It's going into the nations. It's going around the surrounding areas and reaching out to the Gentiles. And so he's trying to encourage them, Peter is, in the midst of a lot of suffering. And I thought about this recently with the pandemic, the COVID and things, being part of Christ Central and the church that you guys are and the people that we work with and all around the world. We're in 26 nations as Christ, uh, as Christ Central. We are actually over 300 churches. But actually, in the Western world in which you and I live, uh, we don't suffer nearly as much as in other parts of the world. We are still, even in the midst of pandemic, a very blessed people. We are very prosperous people. We are people that uh, have benefited greatly from what the Lord has done for us. And so I want us to remember, even in the midst of hardship and things that have happened and, and bewilderment, a little bit of confusion, we are still very much, I want to encourage us, we're very much a blessed people because of God being with us. And so he's speaking to them, and he's speaking to these Gentile people in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And he says, you were born into a living hope. You are now part of a new family. And that's who you and I are. We're, we have a new identity. We're a new family. We have a living hope. Uh, even in the midst of suffering and persecution, this living hope uh, is, is really important. This, this fiery trial and the things that Peter talks about later on in chapter 4, he talks about it like this. He says, don't be surprised or think it's strange of this fiery trial that's come upon you. Uh, and it's actually a strange gift. Testing is at times. Uh, in, what, in what sense? Because this fiery trial burns away what we would call false hope, where we put our, our hope and dreams and things. It actually it burns that away. It helps us uh, get rid of the distractions that come sometimes in our lives. And it makes our faith more genuine. That's what he's talking about. Even though it's tried by, by fire, your faith may be refined as pure gold. It's something that's, that's really important. It becomes genuine. It's pure. And it deepens our faith, meaning deepens our trust and our confidence, not in all these other things, but actually in God himself. So I want us to be encouraged by that because Peter's writing to these people that are really in this situation. And the text that I wanted to get to is this. In chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people. This is speaking about us now, and this is speaking about the river center and who we are as a people of God. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
And so I would like to just, uh, if you're a believer this morning, uh, sitting in, in, the, in, the, in the meeting today, or if you're online and you're a believer, I just want you to remember that you have been chosen by God. You belong to the people of God. You have a new identity. And I was thinking about this, uh, I, have to, I have to mention this, because uh, I want to, um, is the fact that we sometimes think that we figured out who God was and, and we made this all happen and we kind of put two and two together and, and all of that. But actually, Peter himself, when he said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, when, when Jesus asked uh, the disciples who they said he was, yeah. um, Peter comes up with the right answer. Uh, but it wasn't about him. He says, blessed are you, because this hasn't been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father. So our being elected or chosen by God was God wooing us, calling us unto himself. That's why we look to him. That's why we give our life to him, because he initiated a work in our hearts. And he's doing that today. So if you're sitting there today as a visitor, you've never given your life to the Lord. I would encourage you as you're, you're, you're sitting there today or you're online today, because God has actually chosen you to be one of his. And he wants you to give your life to him today. And what better day to do it than Easter Sunday would be wonderful to do that. And so he's writing to these people who didn't belong before. They're Gentiles. They're they ostracized. They were outside of God. He's actually saying, you have been chosen. You have a new identity. And you now are a royal priesthood. It was separate before in Israel and the Jewish nation, royalty and the priests. It was a separate entity. But in Jesus, we now have a king and a priest. And so we are now a royal priesthood. It's all been brought together. And we have a responsibility, even as Warren, you said a few minutes ago, to live for him. OK, it's, it's to live for him. We are chosen people to live for him. We're special people because we belong to God. And that's what makes us really uh, I guess a special people, you could say it like that, is because we are, we belong to God. We are the family of God. And I, I've always said something about, uh, you mentioned the book of Acts, you know, the Acts of the Apostles um, this morning, Warren. And God takes the ordinary. I consider myself a very, very ordinary person, uh, very normal. Uh, I was kind of abnormal when I was growing up, actually. Uh, but God takes the very ordinary to do extraordinary things. Amen. And so you as a people in Lebanon, Oregon, as a church, you might consider yourselves very ordinary. Nothing may be very special about you, but actually you are the people of God. You are God's chosen ones. You are a royal priesthood, a people that belongs to God. And God loves to take the very ordinary and do extraordinary things with them. And we have stories about that all throughout the Bible. So we once were not a people, and you mentioned it too as well, Warren. Uh, Ephesians 2, it says, we were enemies of God. We were dead in our sin and our transgression, and by nature deserving of God's wrath. But, I love the, the transition, but because of his great love for us. I want you to know this morning, as you're sitting there as an individual, is that God loves you. He loves you where you're at. He loves you uh, very, very, very much. He's for you. He wants to do great things with you and in you and through you. And it says, God, who's rich in mercy, made us who were dead, now alive in Christ. In the same way, Jesus died, yes, and he was buried, but he came to life. The power of the spirit within him brought him to life again. We who were dead spiritually, the spirit of God upon us has brought us to life. We are alive. We are a living people. We have a living hope that we are, are part of now. So Peter's message to these people was a wonderful message because they were hurting, they were suffering, they were oppression. Uh, they didn't understand that they really belonged, but they were being misunderstood and mistreated. There's real oppression upon them and real suffering upon them. But it says, now you are the people of God. Raise up your head. Have some dignity about you. You are the people of God. So what's the purpose of all this? What does all this mean? And the purpose is to proclaim, meaning to speak out, to say, to announce, to publicize the great things that God has done for us. Amen. You might think you don't have much of a story. The very fact that God loves you and sent his son to die for you and that you're a believer today, if you are a believer today, you have a story to tell. Right. What the wonderful things that God has done for you through Jesus right. Christ, 
We were once in darkness, now we're in light. We were once not a people, we're now the people of God. We were once without mercy, now we're recipients of mercy. We were once without a family, we we're on our own, but now we're in the family of God. We're under God's wrath, but now we're loved and forgiven. We're outsiders, now we have access to God himself. We're sinners, we're forgiven. Uh, the old is gone, the new has come. We have eternal life. I mean, we got it all. I mean, we have everything. And that's what Peter was telling these people is not so much uh, concentrate, I was going to say fijarse in Espanol, but don't so much concentrate on your present circumstance, but remember the future hope that you have. And I think that's what we need to remember all the time. Uh, and so on Easter, okay, that we've heard this morning, I put it down here, the resurrection that we've heard this morning, there's purpose in it all. And Jesus, you know, said, and he promised before he left that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I mentioned four words that begin with the letter P. And it goes like this. He promised us something. There was a promise of power for the purpose of proclamation. Yes. Power, promise, yes. purpose, and proclamation. We are called, you and I, to speak out, to share our story with those that are around us. It doesn't happen on a Sunday morning because we're kind of all in the same club a bit. But when we go home and we go out to our jobs and we go to our, our neighborhoods where we live, we go that in power of the Holy Spirit upon us, we're there to make an influence. We're there to actually extend the kingdom of God. The purpose of all of this is that we can proclaim the good news of the kingdom to all those that are around us. And then to finish, I'll say this. Matthew 28, it's one of the best texts that I know and that you guys know if you are a believer, yep. about going into all the world Amen. to make disciples. It means to make people followers of Christ. We follow him and we lead others to follow him as well, of all nations, of all ethnic groups. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll, say, I'll say this, I wasn't planning on saying this. Um, we have a, I live in Mexico, there's a serious crisis happening uh, on the border right now, and there's people coming all throughout the Americas. They're coming from Asia. They're coming up through Mexico to get to the States. You know what? There are nations of people that need God. And so we need to remember that as you see nations flowing and moving around, that we are called to go to the nations. Now, we might not ever go ourselves. I mean, we might not ever leave Lebanon. We might not leave the city that we're a part of. But these nations are coming to us. And therefore, I say, let's be sensitive and speak out to them, to the nations of the world. But he says, go and make disciples. But the great promise in all of this, which is the promise for you, for me, and for everyone, he says, and surely I will be with you even unto the very end of the age. Amen. We never walk alone. Don't ever forget that. You don't walk alone. We belong to God. He's chosen us to be, uh, to be his people. So that's what I wanted to say this morning uh, to you on Easter. Um, we are called to be a, a, a people, this river centered, the river of God flowing out from, from us to the throne of God, the grace of God to other people. Everything it touches is going to bring life. There's streams in the wasteland. There's going to be great things happening. So you, you've been called uh, to do a great job with purpose um, because you're chosen by God to do that. So Amen. be encouraged this morning. Uh, I'd love to be sitting there with you, but I'm not. I'm sitting yeah here in my home, but it is kind of nice out, nice and sunny. It's going to be about 85 degrees today. Oh, um, not a cloud nice. in the sky. Nice. It's springtime. But anyway, yeah. uh, let me, let me pray for you. Yeah, uh, if I can, uh, I'll pray. And then uh, I'll give it back to you, Warren. Father, I thank you for who you truly are. You are the Lord, our God. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for calling us unto yourself. I pray for those that might not know you today that are sitting uh, there at the River Center and those that might be online. I pray, Father, you continually work in their hearts, help them to see, give them ears to hear what you're trying to show them and what you're trying to speak to them and give them a heart to continually respond to you and your provocation in their lives. I thank you for the River Center and what it's called to be and called to do. Thank you, Lord, for the great things that you've already done with the River Center, but yet those great things that are still to come. Father, thank you that we can be an influence to all the nations of the world, even in places that we think are remote or even places that we think are small. Help us to enlarge our vision, enlarge our hearts, enlarge our understanding to, to understand that you can do great things, extraordinary things with very ordinary people that we are. So I say to you guys as a river center, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up 
his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thanks, Lee. Amen. <laughs>
what a great truth claim this morning is that Jesus Christ is truly our living hope. And so this morning, I, I'm gonna pray over us, but I think it's, it's important if, if, if you're listening online or you're here in this room and you've never made Jesus your living hope, you, there may be other things that you find your hope in, things that, that, that have failed you, things that have turned up empty at the end of the day. Today, you can say, with all of your friends and new family that I want to make Jesus my living hope. I want to declare him my righteousness. That all the working and trying to please man is over. Now we live in an understanding that we do please God and he loves us and cares for us. And all it is, as I'm praying this morning, is that you make a declaration and just say, hey, I want Jesus. Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to take away we talked about we're dead to our sin. And because of Jesus Christ, we can say, I want you to take all the sin. I want to walk in forgiveness every single day. That you've taken this away, and now I'm forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Because he took all of our sins to the tree and died and rose again. That we serve a risen Savior. There's something to live for, and that's Jesus Christ. And we just invite you this morning to be part of this amazing family. So with every head bowed and eyes closed here and, and around the world, we just want to say thank you, Jesus, for what you did on this amazing day or some 2,000 plus years ago, Lord, when you died on the cross and rose on that third day. Lord, you knew as you with the joy, it says in Hebrew, with the joy set before you endured the cross because you knew that there would be people in Lebanon, Oregon, there'll be people around the world in 2021. They'll be catching for the first time an understanding of what Jesus Christ has done. And that you rejoice in going to the cross, knowing that every day preceding the cross, that there will be something amazing that we would have an opportunity to believe in. And Lord, right now, if there's those that yet to believe in you, can take that first step of faith and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to discover this journey with all these amazing people. I want to be on this journey of walking a new life. And what an amazing journey it is. And we just praise you, Jesus, for all that you've done. And we celebrate you now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, as we're concluding this time together, if you're here for the first time or for the thousandth time, uh, we've actually created a new room outside. It's, it's, it, we didn't just build something. But in the Santa Ana room is going to be our welcome center. And that's a place where after the service, if you bring a friend or if you're here for the first time, we'd love to have you go and just hang out. Our pastors and others will be in there. Part of our teams will be in there just to welcome you and to ask, answer questions and actually just to get to know you a little bit. And so as we're ending this time, if you want to take a moment just in the Santa Ana room just off to the left, we invite you to come and hang out with us and spend a little time with us. But hey, we're not done rejoicing, right? This is a continuation of what God is doing in our lives. So we just thank you for coming today, whether you're online or here. God bless you. Have an amazing, an amazing week. Amen. God bless. Hey, everyone. I just want to say thanks a lot for watching the video today. Really appreciate that. One thing you can do to help us out is by subscribing to this channel, then hitting you know, the bell, uh, notifications, making a comment. The more that that happens, the easier it is to find us. So if you can help us out, that would be great. Thanks again for watching us today. Have an awesome, awesome day.